This is Rie Miyoshi. In 2006, she broke up with her then boyfriend, Hideko Kozutsumi. She had a feeling something was off, and she wasn't enjoying Hideto's company anymore. Hideto really didn't take it well. His obsession with her became toxic. Then, stalking turned into threats, and eventually the police got involved. But nothing could stop Hideto, not even prison. On the day he was released from prison, he began his darkest plan yet. And this time, poor Rie would pay with her life. What led Hideto down a murderous path? And what was the big mistake the police made in the investigation? Could Rie's murder have been prevented? This is the full story of Hideto Kozutsumi, the Zushi Stalker. Today's story begins in Zushi, Japan. It's a resort town with splendid beaches and modern cafes in the Kanagawa prefecture. But Rie Miyoshi hadn't lived in Zushi all her life. In fact, she changed both her address and her name. She was born Rie Shibata, and she grew up in a different city in Kanagawa. In 2004, she graduated from university and moved to Tokyo. Around this time, she was working as a freelance designer and writer for various Japanese magazines. Her pen name was Lover of Chopsticks, and she was always active on the internet and in the real world alike. With a passion for self help and self betterment, she was a positive, friendly, and healthy person who worked hard to stay healthy both physically and mentally. Rie would always keep her blog filled with updates on festivals she's visited, fashion trends she was trying, and restaurants she discovered. Her passion was inspiring, and so she attracted a lot of people around her. One of them was Hideto Kozutsumi. He was a 32 year old social science teacher at a private high school. He seemed like a great guy. He was in charge of the school's badminton club and appeared to have the kind of energy that matched Rie's. He seemed to be a happy person. Rie was seven years younger than him, but this didn't faze her at all. They had the same energy and the same interests. After all, they met at a badminton club. They both valued the healthy mind and healthy body mentality. Hideto was very popular at the all girls school he taught. Everyone thought he was a fun teacher, and students couldn't wait to see him in their classes. Hideto's family was equally supportive of him. He was the youngest child, and he'd grown up in a pretty wealthy family. His parents don't remember him causing a lot of trouble as a kid, but he always had one big problem. He would get bored very fast with any hobby he'd picked up. This meant that he never really held a job for more than a few months. He didn't seem to have a passion for anything, but his popularity in school led him to stay a while longer. Over the course of 2004, Rie and Hideto went from badminton partners to friends to lovebirds. They both admired each other for their joy, positive outlook on life, and maturity, and Rie seemed hopeful about this relationship. But as the months flew by, things took a turn for the worse. Hideto really wasn't the jolly, fun guy she met at the badminton club. That was just him being enthusiastic about meeting her. Hideto suffered from extreme bouts of depression, and many times he would just say out loud that he wanted to die. When there were people or students around, he was that smiling, joyful person. But when he would be alone with Rie, his worst side would come out. Slowly, Rie grew tired of Hideto's attitude, and she felt there was nothing she could do to help him gain a more positive perspective. Every piece of advice she gave him, he rejected. And he refused to get help from a doctor, too. So in 2006, Rie gave up and ended the relationship. For Hideto, this was a breaking point. He would never be able to let this go. At first, Hideto tried to win Rie back and convince her to give him another chance. But Rie had given him millions of chances before she broke up with him. Her decision was final. Hideto just couldn't respect this. He called her, emailed her, and texted her several times a day. In fact, the more she ignored him, the angrier he got. And so did his messages. His emails reached a very threatening tone I don't allow you to be happy without me. 
Hideto threatened to take his life if she didn't get back together with him and blamed her for all of his issues. After writing a threatening email, Hideto went to a local park, drank until he almost passed out, then attempted to overdose. He survived, but Leah knew it was time to call the police. She reported stalking, threatening messages, and suicidal behavior. She was concerned both for him and for herself. That day, Hideto received a formal warning from the police. He should stay away from Rie. But Rie didn't know if Hideto would take the warning seriously, and she wanted to look after herself before anyone else could. So she contacted local organizations helping women against stalking and abuse. She asked them for advice on her situation, and everyone suggested the same things. Lia should change her address, work, contact details, and even her name. If this sounds dramatic, it's only because these organizations have dealt with obsessive stalkers for a long time. They know how far some people go to satisfy a dark obsession, and today's case will tragically prove this point. After receiving a formal warning from the police, Hideto seemed to stop his stalking, at least for a while. But he never really could forget her, and he continued to send her hundreds of emails hoping that one day she would reply. But how could Leah reply to this email? I am definitely going to kill you. Of course, he tried to call her too, but the call would go straight to voicemail. And when he visited her home address, another family lived there. He even called Leah's old work office, pretending he was a relative looking for her. In 2008, Hideto was beyond depressed. He didn't care about anything anymore. Well, anything except for Rie. So he quit his job and moved in with his mother. He continued to send Leah emails, but he had no idea Leah was married to another man by now. You see, after she broke up with Hideto, Rie met another man in Tokyo, and the two hit it off immediately. After two years of happy dating, the two decided to get married. So Rie took her husband's name and moved to Zushi. Now she was Rie Miyoshi, and she hoped this would put an even more distance between her and Hideto. But somehow, Hideto's mother found out about Rie's new marriage, and she thought it was a good idea to let her son know. Perhaps she thought it would finally make Hideto let go of his obsession. But this only affected him more. Soon after, Hideto climbed a small hiking trail on Mount Tanigawa and tried to take his own life again. Perhaps he would have died that day had it not been for a group of hikers who found him lying on the ground unconscious. He was flown to a nearby hospital and his life was once again saved. This time, he was sent to a mental hospital for a short period of time. Meanwhile, the police contacted Hideto's family and explained his history of stalking and threatening messages. But when Hideto was released, he went back to his mom and the threatening emails only continued. I will stab you and me. I will kill myself because of you. Around the same time, Leah decided to contact some of her previous clients from her freelance work in Tokyo. The cost of living in Zushi was on the rise and she wanted to supplement her income. But when she contacted her former clients, she signed her emails Lie Shibata. She used her old name so they would recognize her. She also created a brand new Facebook account for networking reasons, and she also wrote her old name there. Before long, Hideto found this account. That's when he also saw her relationship status as married. Finally, his worst fears were confirmed. Being the professional stalker that he was, Hideto got all of Leah's new contact details from her new Facebook page, and his messages got even nastier. He promised to kill Leah and her husband. This was too much. Leah called the police again. Considering his previous warning, the police were quick to arrest Hideto this time. He was sentenced to one year in prison and three years suspended sentence. But here's a sad twist. During the court hearing, the police made a huge mistake. They read out Hideto's arrest warrant, including most of Lia's address and her last name. Now, Hideto knew that Lia lived in Zushi, and he'd even heard the officer name her neighborhood. This was all he needed. Hideto's one-year prison sentence meant nothing to him. It wasn't a wake-up call or a cold shower. It was just time days he would count to the day he could kill Lie. 
When Hideto was released from prison, a restraining order was placed. He was to never contact Dia again, not even by email. However, he didn't care about this. All he cared about was his revenge. He went to Yahoo Answers asking questions to better his stalking skills. How do I find out more about a person by their phone number? Hideto asked about 400 questions online, many of which revolved around a small temple festival that he knew Dia attended every year in October. This way, he found out where this kind of temple was in Zushi, and he figured Dia would be living close by. Between March and April 2012, Hideto sent more than 1,000 emails to Lie. The message was the same, albeit expressed in different words. You promised to marry me, but instead, you went and married another man. I demand compensation. Lie didn't waste any time in reporting these messages to the police. From her point of view, Hideto had to go to prison for a longer time. Clearly, he hadn't gotten the message the first time. But outrageously, this time, the police said there was nothing more they could do. On the one hand, the police argued that Hideto was no longer making death threats. Without explicit violent threats, the police couldn't intervene, and demanding compensation just wasn't explicit enough. On the other hand, harassment by phone and fax was illegal in Japan at the time, but regular emails weren't. Lie begged for Hideto to be arrested again, but the police said the situation was out of their hands this time. The only thing they did do was install CCTV cameras around Ria's home and increase the patrols in the neighborhood. However, in October 2012, the police asked Lie if Hideto had contacted her in the previous months at all, and she confirmed he hadn't. So the police uninstalled the CCTV cameras and reduced the patrols to their original frequency. But Hideto was just planning his revenge from the shadows. Hideto never stopped obsessing over Rie. Not after their breakup in 2006. Now, his radio silence was just a way to lure Lie into easing her defensiveness. If she thought she was safe, perhaps she would start making mistakes again, like when she gave her old name online. In the fall of 2012, Hideto hired a private detective and told him he was looking for an old friend who had helped him manage his depression in Tokyo. I wanted to contact you to get a quote for locating people. The person I want you to investigate is my savior. She is a person who taught me various things about depression. I was ignorant about depression when I was hospitalized with severe depression, and she was consulting with me kindly. I believe that I can live without committing suicide thanks to that benefactor. Since I would like to thank her directly, I would like to request an address search. So please give me a quote. What I know about the beneficiary is her name, birth date, former workplace, current approximate address, Zushi City, Kanagawa Prefecture, and so on. Before finding his private investigator, Hideto had sent the same message to another PI company. But they thought his story was a bit sketchy, and Hideto's email address was even sketchier. bitchshibarie at yahoo.co.jp so they searched his email address and found all sorts of horrible posts online. He was not the kind of person they wanted to help. But a second company was happy to help. And in less than 24 hours, Hideto had Lie's full address. It's pretty outrageous that anyone can get your home address through a private investigator and the investigator won't ask for your consent. And do you want to know how the investigator got Lie's address? He just called the government's tax department, claiming he was Lie's husband. No one asked for proof that he was her husband. Even more outrageously, Lie had specifically applied for tighter restrictions around her personal details. The government had completely overlooked this. For Hireto, this was the perfect birthday present. You see, it was November 5th when he received Lie's home address, and on November 6th, he would celebrate his 40th birthday. So the following day, he decided to give himself the ultimate birthday present. In broad daylight, on November 6, 2012, Hideto arrived at Lie's home with a cardboard box, knife, and rope. The box was just to disguise himself as a delivery man. But once he reached the front door, he realized Lie could easily see his face if he knocked. She would never let him in willingly. So he checked all the windows and found one that was unlocked. He pried it open and sneaked into Lia's bedroom. Tragically, Lia was home alone at the time. 
As soon as Hideto spotted Lie, he jumped on her and stabbed her multiple times until she fell on the floor, gurgling and bleeding out on the floor. He watched her for minutes on end, seeing the life drain out of her and realizing his plan was finally complete. Well, not quite. Remember, he'd brought a rope? Within an hour, Hideto carefully constructed a noose, tied it to the balcony railing, and hung himself. Now, his horrible plan was complete. Just after 3 p.m. that day, the police were called to Lia's residence after a passerby saw Hirito's body hanging from the balcony railing. Soon enough, they found Lia's body lying in a pool of blood in her bedroom. The police quickly ran Lia's name through the system, and it became clear what had happened. Her obsessive stalker of six years had finally caught up to her, thanks to the big mistakes made by the police and the government. Compared to many other cases, the case of Lie Miyoshi felt awfully quiet. There were no arrests, no trial, and no charges in her murder. Of course, Hideto had taken his own life, and the police knew he was the only one responsible for it. In one last cowardly act, Hideto escaped justice and avoided the pain, rage, and frustration of all those left devastated by Lie's untimely death. Lie's husband, in particular, was destroyed. Ever since he started dating Lie, he knew of Hideto and he worried about him constantly. He always supported Lie in reporting him to the police and was equally frustrated when he was released. He liked to believe that Hideto would never make his threats come true, but he did. Lie was only 33 when she was burned inside her own home. So, Lie's husband sued the city of Zushi for leaking information that led to Lie's murder. The police were guilty of sharing Lie's partial address with Hideto, and the government was guilty of sharing her full address with the private investigator poising at Lie's husband. He sued for 11 million yen, the equivalent of $90,000, and won the suit, but he was only rewarded a tenth of the sum. The city acknowledged that when reading out the arrest warrant, they should have kept her new last name private and used her maiden name. Japanese lawmakers also strengthened the anti-stalking laws to include the act of repeatedly sending unwanted emails as part of stalking behavior allowing the police to take action. The police officer who read out Ria's address to Hideto was reprimanded, and the 61-year-old private investigator was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. His methods were illegal, and he never asked for consent from Ria either. What makes this case truly tragic is that Lia did everything right from the very beginning of her breakup. She cut contact with Hideto, reported his threatening messages to the police over and over again, and changed her whole life so as to gain distance from him. But nothing worked. Hideto was intent on killing her, and the authorities were sloppy enough to let that happen. In one final tragic twist, Hideto's mother told reporters, I wish he had died alone. There were a thousand opportunities to stop Hideto from committing the ultimate double murder. Had he taken his mental health more seriously, had he been kept in the mental hospital for longer, or had he been sent to prison a second time, perhaps he never would have taken two lives that day. But sadly, cases like these only happen when there's a long list of errors first. Lia had to pay with her life for Hideto's obsession to stop. The government might have changed some of its anti-stalking laws since, but Lia's family will forever have to live with the pain of losing her in such a horrific way. Thanks for watching, you guys. What are your thoughts on this case? Write us a comment, and before you go, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next time, and stay safe.